Welcome. This is the uh, supply chain risk in the 2024 data breach investigations report. It's a pillar report from Verizon uh, that is just pretty much what we use to assess the state of cybersecurity. So we're really happy to um, have with us Phil Langlois, who is a senior principal threat, uh, senior principal for threat intelligence at Verizon Business. He's currently working as a lead engineer and the author, one of uh, four authors of the 2024 Verizon uh, DBIR. And uh, prior to that, uh, Phil worked with CIS, uh, leading data, some data-driven projects, uh, including the CIS controls and the uh, MS ISAC nationwide security review. Um, and uh, when not working or recreationally programming, very impressed that you do that, Phil. Uh, <laughs> He enjoys the great outdoors in upstate New York with his wife, son, and two dogs. Uh, Phil, welcome. Say hi. Hey, pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. It's really great to have you. Our, uh, and we've got a couple folks from here in Reversing Labs uh, joining us on the line as well. Uh, let me first uh, introduce you to uh, Ashley Benj, who is the Director of Threat Intelligence here at Reversing Labs. She is an astrophysicist turned security threat researcher and threat hunter. Ashley's passionate about making security accessible for everyone and bridging the gap between technical and non-technical teams. Prior to Reversing Labs, Ashley worked in threat hunting and threat intelligence at Cisco, as well as Zero Fox. And uh, she's an avid weight uh, weightlifter and an Olympic weightlifting coach. And I also learned a very talented collegiate equestrian. Ashley, welcome. Hi there, happy to be here. I, I'm, I'm very tempted to want to spend the next hour talking about Phil's dogs and about your experience riding horses, but we're instead gonna talk about DBR. <laughs> Almost as cool. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And also with us, we have Dan Petrillo, who is the Vice President of Product Marketing at Reversing Labs. Dan's experience in security strategy uh, began as the product manager for an industrial IoT company, uh, where he's responsible for uh, secure, the securing uh, building automation systems, what classic IoT platforms often targeted. He spent time leading product marketing for Cyber Reason, Morphosec, Gardecore, and Akamai before joining RL. And Dan's a graduate of Northeastern, uh, where he received his sci uh, Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering here in Boston. Dan, welcome. Hey, Paul. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. So obviously, a talented crew here uh, for this uh, webinar, and we're, we're lucky to have you, and I'm grateful to have you all. Before we get going, um, let's talk just for a second about um, reversing labs and uh, what we do as a company. Uh, again, we're the host of the webinar. Um, reversing Labs is a company we based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we've been around in the cybersecurity business for actually 15 years. And for much of that time, we're best known uh, for our repository of malware, goodware, we have a repository of about 40 billion files, one of the basically the largest collection of malware in the world. Uh, and that number continues to grow as our threat research team is constantly analyzing and categorizing new instances of malware, goodware, grayware every day. Um, and that repository is used to help organizations understand what it is that they're finding on their network or that's being sent at them, uh, help understand malware and threats. Uh, what you may not know is that Reversing Labs is a supplier to many, 60 of the leading cybersecurity companies uh, in the world. They turn to us for uh, threat, re threat intel feeds, uh, as well as solutions to help them analyze malware. Um, and uh, we're increasingly focused on the software supply chain risk era as the as threats have moved back into the supply chain. So now the malware might be hiding in a piece of commercial software, or open source software, that long history that we have uh, and, and an intel about threats is incredibly important to stopping and preventing those attacks. And we've received accolades from our premier channel partner program, along with being recognized by Gartner 
as a leading software supply chain security provider. And interestingly, we were a provider of information data to this year's uh, data breach investigations report. So we gave rise in some of our data on threat on uh, supply chain threats uh, that made it into the report. So we we're really honored to uh, be able to do that. Okay, let's uh, move ahead. Uh, just taking a quick look at the agenda for today, um, we're going to start out uh, hearing from Phil about uh, this year's data breach investigations report and the key findings. Um, and then we're going to go on and sort of talk about some of the implications of what's in the DBIR, uh, including the issues around vulnerabilities and vulnerability disclosure and kind of what, you know, the industry has been very oriented around vulnerabilities, um, what the future looks like um, and in terms of getting in front of threats and attacks. Um, we're going to talk about what's driving data breaches, both in 2023 and this year and looking forward. Um, and we're going to talk about supply chain risk. Uh, that is just a growing phenomena, and it really requires a sort of shift in mindset um, from both software producers as well as end user organizations that consume software, which is basically all of us. Um, and uh, talk about some of the you know prominent incidents of the last year or so, supply chain related incidents, um, and how we as both software makers, producers, as well as consumers, uh, can kind of get our house in order and find and get ourselves more uh, resilient to these types of attacks. So really full agenda. We got an hour. We're going to take your questions. And to start it off, um, why don't we hear from Phil about this year's data breach investigation report? Phil, I'm going to throw it over yeah. to you. Great. Perfect. Yeah, let's rock and roll. Um, so we can actually jump right to the next slide. Uh, so as mentioned, I'm Phil Langua. I'm work on the DBIR as the lead data scientist slash engineer slash make funny memes type person on the report. Um, but, you know, this is really, you know, I think you have to, to stress, this is a collaborative effort. Uh, the report isn't done just by Verizon. It's done by Verizon and partners in the industry. I shouldn't go back to the last slide. Sorry, I didn't want to jump ahead too far. But it's done by, by partners in industry. So obviously, I'm, it's always a pleasure to hop on you know, webinars and talk about the cool report. The first thing that's kind of worth diving into the report is the cover. So we spend probably too much time worrying about the cover because it ends up being kind of how we drive home the motif of the report. So this year, what we really wanted to do was drive home how our organization is getting compromised, right? What are the ways into an organization from an external actor? So what you see here is the door that's slightly ajar. And you see also in the bottom, you have a light as well as, uh, you know, these little bars stacked. And what that actually represents is our data set. And it looks in terms of the couple main ways in which organizations are compromised. So a little spoiler alert, there's uh, some vulnerabilities involved in one of the main ways. Uh, but before getting ahead of ourselves, we can actually go to the next slide. So for those who don't know, the DBIR has been around for 17 years. It originally started with just data Verizon had from its own incident response. After a couple of years of doing that, we were joined by federal partners such as the US Secret Service who voluntarily came to us and actually gave us their data and said, help us tell the story. Uh, from there, we've been working with organizations across the world, uh, which is why we're able to have representation from across 94 different countries. So, you know, it's really kind of this, this community effort, uh, which is always uh, kind of aligned with my, my career aspiration. I've always enjoyed working with the community. So, so I'm always happy to share the experiences. So when it comes down to the actual data set, what we had was 30,000 incidents, 10,000 of those were breaches. So if people remember their, uh, their CISP days, right? They have the CIA, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. An incident is anything that impacts any one of those three. A breach is something that specifically impacts breaches. So since this is the data breach report, we have a tendency of focusing on those breaches, but there's a lot of stuff that kind of happens within the incidents that are also worthwhile talking about. So we can move on to the next slide. So when we're talking about the ways in, so how are the, these external actors entering and getting to organizations? None of these, I think, findings are necessarily shocking, right? Anyone that's worked in cybersecurity should be pretty familiar with things like phishing, right? Use of stolen credentials, and then, of course, exploiting vulnerabilities. 
I think what is most surprising is the ratios, right? We see exploding credentials showing up pretty much consistently at the top, right? We, we found that over the last 10 years or so, it's about 30% of our breaches involve that as kind of one of the main actions. Um, phishing, of course, is kind of maintain a relatively consistent uh, area, but the area of growth that's happened the most over the last year was exploding vulnerabilities, which has almost tripled. So it's increased 180% since last year. And this was due largely to a singular event, which was Move It, where adversaries were able to quickly mobilize on a zero day on a file transfer application and then pull all the data and hold it for ransom. So you know, we had you know, great visibility in terms of the, um, the scope of the vulnerability and the scope of the, the incident. So we have a lot of good data in terms of who was impacted um, and you know what industries were they from. But we also have to keep in mind that this isn't a one-off, right? This wasn't just a, you know, they woke up one day and like, I wonder if zero days will work for my ransomware organization. Uh, they were actually leveraging zero days a few months prior with similar levels of success. It's just this one ended up being extremely successful in terms of the large breadth of uh, both in terms of the types of organizations impacted but also in terms of the amount of data that was compromised. So we've seen this kind of large growth and it's also you know, occurring, you know, zero days once again, aren't new. We Nation states have been leveraging it, um, but I think there's kind of this evolution with ransomware where the actors are getting enough um, either expertise or have enough money where they can pay folks that have that expertise. So we're seeing kind of this, this shift. Uh, and when it comes down to what's being exploited, what we're largely seeing is things like web applications, right? And that's kind of a very generic, high-level view as to what's being uh, exploited, but it tends to be things that are internet accessible somehow, right? Because that's where the bad guys are attacking from. So if we start going down a little bit more into detail, in the next slide, we're going to start looking in terms of, there we go. The, the big picture of vulnerabilities, right? I think vulnerabilities and patching them has been uh, pretty much the bread and butter of cybersecurity since uh, there's been patches. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's unfortunately, it's still a difficult problem. And what you actually see here is the survival analysis of the CISA known exploited vulnerabilities in terms of the patch rate. So for those who don't know, CISA publishes uh, a lot of vulnerabilities that they know based on what they're tracking from threat intelligence incidents of vulnerabilities that are being actively exploited by adversaries, either nation states, criminal organizations, what have you, right? They know that these vulnerabilities are being used. So I always look at it as being the, the, the known criticals of the criticals, right? These are the very bad vulnerabilities uh, that organizations really need to, to prioritize in terms of patching just because it, there's attackers that have actively started to leverage these. And what you see is that there's a fair amount of time between uh, how long it takes for these vulnerabilities to get patched. So within 30 days, 85% of the vulnerabilities were still not remediated. And at 55 days, 50% 50 of those vulnerabilities were unremediated or were remediated if you're a glass half full person. So there's kind of this the this race, if you will, right, between our ability to patch the vulnerabilities, and then on the other side is the ability for adversaries to leverage these these exact same vulnerabilities. So when we started looking at honeypot data, we found that the median time for scanning of a new CISA KEV was about five days. So we have to take that into contrast. It takes us about 55 days for 50% of these vulnerabilities to be remediated. It takes about five days for the adversaries to start scanning for those. Um, so, you know, I think it's uh, it, it speaks volumes. You know, it's it's a lot easier to write a POC than it is to get meetings with shareholders, discuss downtimes, discuss impact, get things through the change management board, right? So there's kind of this asymmetry that exists between our ability to patch and then our ability to uh, an adversary's ability to look for the same vulnerabilities. So if we go to the next slide. And then what we're going to do is kind of look at the bigger picture. So obviously we have this, this conflict that exists between our ability to remediate vulnerabilities, actors' abilities to exploit them and exploit them at scale. But we also have to just take in the context some of the larger 
uh, other findings we have within the report that I think are important context. So for example, human element is still one of the major drivers for breaches. Uh, 68% involve the human element. When we're talking about the human element, we're talking about both folks that accidentally send email to the wrong individual, such as heirs, and then also folks that fall for things like phishing emails. All right, so this is still kind of one of the major drivers. So obviously, you know, vulnerability does have a very uh, technical slant to it, um, but we can't forget that there's always a human element as part of, not always, but there's a, a large percentage that has a human element as part of the issue as well. And then when we're looking at, I think what's really interesting for this group is the 15% of breaches involving a third party. So this is a, a statistic that we've been finessing and trying to really find the right um, query and data verbiage for uh, because it, it encompasses a lot, right? And we've done a large amount of discussion in terms of third parties and software vendors, especially when Solar Winds came out, right? Because that was one of these, these major events where we saw software vendors being a, uh, a vector for compromise, right? Where a malicious backdoor was inputted into a the software build, impacted thousands of organizations, right? So we really started to look at this issue in terms of how much of the risk does the organization in itself own and how much of the risk is kind of placed on these third parties, right? And this is where it's, you know, well, what do we mean by third party and how do you really manage that risk? So we're talking about third party ends up being a very large network of different types of organization be partners that have access to your environment can be hosting providers, right? Because there's also been, of course, breaches and incidents where hosting providers were compromised and your data was just kind of vacuumed as part of that compromise. You also have third party software vendors being served as a vector, kind of like the solar winds kind of incidents. And then you have the risks in which third party software vendors are introducing by writing insecure code, right? So the vulnerabilities that exist in their code represent vulnerabilities that can also exist in your environment. Whether or not you know they exist, um, they, you know, they do exist in some fashion. So it just ends up being very complicated to, to pull how much risk do I have control over and how much do I own? And this is something that we're gonna be tracking, I think over the years. So I think it's, it's an important metric and uh, we're actually in very great company, I think, here to talk a little bit more in detail in terms of the what does that really represent from a day-to-day -day and like protective standpoint. Go to the next slide. Hopefully, it's a good cue up for for Ashley. Oh, this is the this is the summary slide. If anyone wants to take a quick snapshot, um, this is just all the key findings. I talked about the major ones that were relevant. Uh, of course, you are encouraged to read the report. We have 100 pages of great content that go into all of these specifics. Um, but I think we're really just interested in, in getting a little bit down and dirty with the uh, discussion on supply chain, which I think is a setup for you, Ashley. It is, yeah. Thanks for that, Phil. So as Phil mentioned, um, we're going to go ahead and start talking about some of the interesting um, data around software supply chain threats. And one of the statistics I found really interesting in this year's report is that if you compare the third-party software um, breaches, breaches that are stemming from something to do with the third-party software compromise, what you actually see is this huge jump of 68% of when you compare last year's report versus this year's report. And when you take that and you average it across the year, that's about four breaches per day. So it's pretty significant. And when we say third-party software, what we're really talking about is this wide range of, of things, but a couple of examples would be partner infrastructure that's affected maybe by uh, some software supply chain issues, uh, the compromise of a software supply chain, uh, if an organization is affected by third-party software vulnerabilities, uh, breaches that result because uh, an organization could have been mitigated or prevented were uh, a better choice made with uh, security vendors that they use. And so this, this really diverse group of, of third parties is ultimately what we're talking about when we talk about software supply chain threats. Uh, you can go ahead and click to the next slide. And so Reversing Labs did some of our own research, and what we found is this really enormous increase uh, between the time period of 2020 and 2023. And 
this is in the, the number of malicious open source packages. And so how do these two things relate? How are we going from third-party software to open source packages? And the answer there is that open source sits under a lot of these commercial uh, commercial softwares that, that you would buy. And so this is a, a tremendously large number, right? 1,300% increase is kind of hard to comprehend. But I, I think we can all agree that this is significant in some way if we're seeing this and it indicates that malicious actors are really interested in this as an attack surface. And so what we're hypothesizing here is that not only is open source in a, a potential attack vector in and of itself, but it also is a great attack vector if you're looking to compromise commercial software. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. And so like I said, there's this dependence of much of our, our paid software uh, or the, the commercial software that, that we're using in just about every enterprise environment. And so this is, like I said, the, the reason this makes for such a frequently targeted attack surface. And when these kinds of open source components are compromised and used in commercial software, it's really difficult for most security solutions to detect this. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. But given the, the size and complexity of most modern software packages, uh, you can kind of see how that would be difficult to, to fully break apart and analyze and determine if there are any threats, uh, ideally before you bring that into your organization. And so when you extrapolate that out, what you're really trying to evaluate when you are looking at a piece of commercial software is not only how well that company was able to develop their code to be free from vulnerabilities or any potential entry points, but also how much effort have, have their vendors or partners or third parties that they use or open source repositories that are in this commercial software, how well have all of those things been reviewed and secured? And so this is a, a lot of moving parts for something that is a very attractive threat vector and something that's really garnering a lot of attention from would-be bad actors. Uh, next slide, please. And so what we've got here is a little bit of a timeline. And I think if I were to go across this timeline and list out all of these attacks, you probably would have heard of them because these were so widely covered in security news. And so what this says is that this is more frequently associated with large scale, widely publicized attacks, you know, 3CX, JetBrains, MoveIt. A uh, really interesting one recently was that XZ utils compromise. And so why would this be? Why is this such an attractive threat vector? And the reason for that, or one of the reasons for that, is that when you compromise a developer of a software, if you put your bad actor hat on and you think like an attacker for a moment, what you're really able to do is then compromise the customers of all of, of, of that developer of software. And then ultimately, after those customers are compromised, then you have the pool of all of those end users at each of those companies as potential targets. And so this is a really great return on investment. Uh, you get a lot of compromised devices for maybe not as much effort as you would for other methods. And I think this is really um, able to be seen if you think about sort of the traditional attack flow where maybe a vulnerability would be compromised and as a bad actor, then you have access to all of the, the users in an enterprise of that piece of, of software that was compromised. Instead, uh, we sort of see this exponential growth of potential uh, targeted compromised devices when you add in that component of compromising the actual developer. And I think something that, that's interesting to think about is that although there are only so many developers of software, all of us are probably consumers of, of software in some way. Uh, I have yet to meet anyone that is not using a single piece of software. I think you'd have to get pretty off grid to, to find that. So for the vast majority of, of enterprises, there are many potential ingress points for, for a threat actor. And so when you think about this, this is a really great way for a, a threat actor to be able to, to maximize their profit, to really um, help to cover their tracks. It's really difficult, as I said, to to actually detect uh, that a seemingly benign piece of software is being used uh, as, as a point of initial access. And one of the reasons for that is that when you are purchasing software, you're developing sort of this innate level of trust, right? You probably wouldn't purchase a sketchy piece of software for any amount of money. 
And so the, the activity that would come from that piece of software is maybe not looked at with a high level of scrutiny like other sorts of malicious activity would be. And so this makes it much less likely that this is actually noticed by an enterprise looking to track what kinds of um, potential threats they're seeing. And it also makes it, like I said, really difficult for most security solutions to detect because you have to be able to distinguish between benign software doing its normal benign things and that same benign software doing maybe something that's a, a little bit different that could be potentially malicious or it could just be odd behavior. As defenders, we have to be correct 100% of the time. And so, you know, attackers only need to be successful once. And that really ups the stakes here. And so not only is this a, a potentially really lucrative um, situation for a, a threat actor to exploit, I think it's also really interesting to stop and think about who ultimately are the victims in these scenarios, and then who ultimately holds the responsibility for securing this pipeline from software developers and producers to software consumers. Because ultimately, I think it's clear in these situations that, that both the developer and the consumer are victims here. And so we have to think about where and with whom that responsibility for securing this ultimately lies. And so with that, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Dan. Ashley, thank you so much. And uh, Bill, you as well. This is a lot of great, great data to work with. Um, and, you know, Ashley, you said something that I think is important to, to talk about for a second, which is we have to think like the attacker. Um, and you can go ahead to the, to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, you know, and I think that's important to do because cybersecurity is a second order chaotic system. And what do I mean by that? I mean that it's a system that reacts to our attempts to defend against it. So contrast that with a first order chaotic system, which would be like the weather. If it's going to rain and you bring out an umbrella, it's not going to rain sideways to bypass your umbrella. But when it comes to cybersecurity, if you bring out a tool set of defenses, the threat actor is going to react to those and try to bypass your defenses. So let's take a look at you know legacy AppSec. Um, I think that's a lot like an umbrella. We brought that out and we stopped the rain, but it's not the rain, it's a threat actor. And the threat actors are bypassing our traditional legacy AppSec tools. And so it's incumbent on us, the vendors, to, to build tools that can actually deal with that. And if you click the build once, please, you'll see that there's a whole suite of challenges of, of sideways rain, upwards rain, that's bypassing legacy AppSec tools. Things like malware, tampering, secrets and IP, hardening and, and behavior are all new material risks that need to be tracked uh, and to go beyond what's being done now. So, you know, we've seen a lot of data that's shown some alarming <laughs> trends. Um, we've looked at some alarming attacks, but, um, that's the for, first step to progress is being aware of, of what it is. And then we can start building towards that. And we've talked about the responsibility here. And, and I think it's a shared responsibility. It's the responsibility of us, the the software vet, uh, the security tool vendors. It's the responsibility of the devs uh, building this software. And it's a responsibility of actually the folks bringing that software into their environment and deploying it and being sure that it's going to be, uh, it's not going to bring in um, material risk. Next slide, please. So we pulled uh, some some of our favorite bits uh, from the DBIR report to, I think, double click on. I really like this quote. I think there's a lot to explore here, which says, as much as we can argue that the software developers are also victims when vulnerabilities are disclosed in their software, and sure, they are, the incentives might not be aligned properly for those developers to handle this seemingly inter, uh, interminable uh, task. Um, so, uh, interminable task, excuse me, sorry. Um, so, you know, thoughts here are, you know, we really need to consider who is responsible here and consider that maybe it's not just the responsibility of the dev. We can look towards the producers as another opportunity for us to find these vulnerabilities, find these areas of potential risk. You know, Ashley, you said that the, the, um, the threat actor only has to be right once and we have to be right 100% of the time. Well, we can give ourselves more opportunities if we look at the entire life cycle of this software. So if we can, if we put some of the responsibility on the folks as they're developing, 
testing and shipping the software, but also extend that responsibility to the folks who are purchasing and deploying and using the software, we've actually given ourselves two opportunities, doubled our dark chances of uh, not allowing one of these um, supply chain issues to be one that can be capitalized on by a threat actor. Next slide, please. Another quote that we really like here uh, from the report is, we recommend that organizations start looking at ways of making better choices so as to not reward the weakest links of the chain. I think there's a few ways to make better choices um, and data is at the heart of that, um, both in terms of this report and the data that it provides, but also in the data you can gather from the tools that you're building and from the tools that you're deploying. I think that right now commercial software and updates remain a black box and enterprise buyers relying solely on questionnaires or annual pen tests cannot make better choices in real time about a specific application update, which is how the major supply chain uh, software supply chain breaches are happening. The only way to get that visibility is to assess the actual package or update your organization is about to deploy and use automated policy controls to determine if its risk profile has significantly changed. Next slide, please. I think that a lot of folks are interested in these DBIR reports because they provide a lot of value to a broad spectrum of types of people. For me, it's been required reading for myself and my teams my entire career. I, I love these reports and I love that they managed to make me laugh out loud. Like <laughs> I would never have expected that before I started reading them. But, you know, Phil, you mentioned a hundred pages of good data. It, it goes by quick. Um, it's fascinating and, and useful and oftentimes uh, some good jokes in there. Um, but I mentioned that here because, you know, for the folks who are on the line, I suspect there's folks here who are interested in this data because they're producing software. I suspect there are folks here because they're buying software. And I suspect there are folks here because they're responsible for securing their enterprises against these types of attacks. And for uh, no matter who you are, you have the opportunity to take a look at the software that is being built, that is being deployed, and that is being used in your environment and so that you can build safer software, that you can buy software safely, and that you can stay safe. Uh, as your con organization continues to ad adopt these technologies that are needed for the organization to thrive and grow and become more agile. Doing this soft, uh, doing these types of things securely allows for security to not be the enemy of pro productivity, but rather an enabler of productivity so that you can be confident that the tools that you're using can be brought in and leveraged so that your business can do more without expanding your attack surface. Next slide, please. So um, one thing that I think is important to talk about, if if, uh, if just briefly, because I do want to leave some time for, for some questions, is the SBOM. Here at Reversing Labs, we are huge proponents of the SBOM. We think it's absolutely essential for dealing with these types of attacks. But we have to call it what it is, which is really a list of ingredients. And a list of ingredients doesn't have inherent value. You have to understand what those ingredients mean to you and your business, and then act on that meaning to actually get value from it. You know, I think about it when I go to the grocery store, I have a son with allergies. Um, we're trying to be very healthy and I can look at a list of ingredients, but unless I know which he's allergic to and call those out, it might be uh, akin to a vulnerability, or we look at the how caloric it is or how sugary it is, or how, um, you know, if there's risky additives in there, if, if that's not being surfaced, then I'm not really getting value from seeing that list of ingredients. And what RL wants to offer folks is a means of scanning that ingredients rapidly and surfacing all of this stuff. We'll tell you if you're if it's too caloric or if it's got uh, allergens in there. We'll tell you if there's malware, there's secrets, there's tampering. Taking the S bomb to the next level and surfacing all that uh, meaning that's between the lines is gonna really help you make better choices when you are building your software and to understand that that thing that you have built and are ready to ship off, you can be confident that it is a secure piece of software. And just like I said before, on the other side of the spectrum, when you're 
bringing that into your organization, being able to go beyond the SBOM and uh, do something of value with it uh, is going to really help you get the confidence that you're bringing in something that is not going to create risk. Last but not least, uh, next slide, please, is I have a quote from, um, from Jen Easterly, the director of CISA, that I find is really appropriate to this conversation. Our goal should be to shift away from focusing on individual vulnerabilities and to instead consider the issue from a strategic lens. By focusing on recurring classes of software defects, we can inspire software developers to improve the tools, technologies, and processes and uh, attack software quality problems at the root. Again, I think it's incumbent on all of us, on those who are surfacing the data, on those who are building the tools, on those who are building the security tools and those who are implementing the tools to start to address these quality problems as early as possible, but also not put the entire onus there to understand that it is our responsibility at every step of the way to ensure that what we are building and what we're buying and what we're using does not have these inherent problems. I think the data from the DBIR report showed just how insidious and problematic supply chain attacks can be, um, but it takes it's going to take a team to to deal with them effectively. Um, I think I've said all I've I've wanted to layer on there. I want to open up another opportunity for my team here, Phil or Ashley. Uh, if there's anything you wanted to layer on there, um, and then if not, I think we've got some really fun questions to uh, to address. Uh, after that. Let's dive into the questions. There's some great ones. Cool. Let's do it. Yeah. There are got a lot of questions uh, during, during the, during the slides, which is great. And um, let it, yeah, let's um, let's get to them. Um, so uh, the first one is uh, from Siveron uh, and um, it is, I guess for Phil, can you share the state of current CVE, CVD trends um, or fidelity for organizations treating them as a holy grail on their security risk management activities? So, um, you know, what, we 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 know back in February there was a there was a big kind of hiccup in the whole CVE issuing process, and they just basically stopped issuing them. I think that has shaken people's confidence that they should be using CVEs as their North Star of their security program. So I think that that's kind of my my read of what Sivaram's asking about. That is a $10,000 question. I don't think I'm gonna be able to do the answer. I'll draw it up 10,000. Uh, yeah, I mean, in, in general, you know, it, it's always a challenge because you never really wanna rely on one single data source, right? To get your, your truth, right? Because there's always, everything has some intrinsic bias to it. Um, so you have to make sure you, when you do approach your vulnerabilities, you, you approach it from a, um, you know, a bigger scale, right? A little more, I want to say holistic, that sounds a little too, too granola, but a, uh, a wide encompassing approach, right? Which would include, you know, it's not just CVEs, right? Because there's vulnerabilities go way beyond just, you know, known things that are bad. It's also like business logic. And, you know, there's a whole there's a whole domain of extremely intelligent people who could probably do a little bit more justice on topic. Um, I don't know if Ashley or Dan, uh, you guys want to write off on this one a little bit or. I don't know that I've got much to add that you didn't say, Phil. Yeah, that, that, that covers it quite nicely. I appreciate that. That's a great question. It is absolutely. I wish I had yeah, an I, answer. I, 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 I mean, I I do know just just recently. Um, I think CISA has has announced uh, both you know partnerships. Uh, sorry, NIST has announced uh, you know hiring a contractor to help it get through that backlog. I think it's working with CISA as well to kind of clear that away. I think they've set September as their date. Um, and then there there's this whole kind of vulnerable enrichment um, initiative, which is about just adding context to the CVE data. It's but it all comes down to resources and funding and staffing <laughs> and also scale, right? I mean, more companies reporting vulnerabilities is great. Getting CVEs is great, but you got to have people on the other end to be able to take that information and work with it. So I think we're going to be seeing that work out in the months ahead. Um, so an anonymous attendee um, had a question about when we're talking about third party related issues or breaches. Um, 
they want to know, are you counting all events and breaches that involve a vulnerability as also third party related issues? So are, are, are we are we conflating a vulnerability in third party software with a third party issue? Yeah, absolutely. I think so I know the answer. Yeah, that's another great question. The um, So it, at this point, it kind of does consume a little bit of this in-house software. But there's a big caveat is that a large amount of our data, we don't necessarily have that level of detail as to whether, oh, this was a, you know, a COT software, this was a, you know, an in-house software. But when we do have that information, it tends to be, you know, vulnerabilities that were known. Right, CVEs, so vulnerabilities that have a CVE, whether in the backlog or not, um, but it tends to be these vulnerabilities within third-party software. But you know, of course, there's always going to be these these in-house ones. Uh, our data just doesn't quite have that level of granularity, and you know that that comes down to the level of information we receive from our partners, and you know what we're able to to extract from that. Okay, good answer. Um... Another another question from uh, from Sivaram um, wants to know on uh, so DBIR listed exploitation uh, of vulnerabilities as the uh, number one attack vector um, and showing a big jump percentage wise. Uh, what do we attribute that to? Um, is this about more sophisticated vulnerabilities, or is this one of those you know you you you, you know you measure what what you you detect and measure what you can detect and measure? So it's it's more about ease of you know our ability to detect vulnerabilities and and uh, measure them. I guess that's cool. I, yeah. I think it's a uh, it's a mismatch of of a couple of different elements coming together, right? The United States and a lot of European countries have very uh, mature uh, data breach disclosure requirements. Um, so, you know, now we're, we're getting to the point where we're having more visibility in these breaches because people have to report on those breaches. So we're able to get a better in view into the data. Um, ransomware actors love talking about it when they breach because it just adds a little additional fire to get people to pay. Um, so, you know, we're getting to the point where from a, a data standpoint, ransomware and extortion has become such a popular way of monetizing access, like a vulnerability. Yeah that, you know, it, if they found a zero day or they found some way, you know, they're, it's going to show up in our data somehow, right? Because they're the victim that are going to have to disclose it happened or the ransomware actor is going to disclose that they did it. So we're, we're getting, I think, very good visibility as to from the criminal use of vulnerabilities. Nation states have always, not always, but been frequently using zero days for a while, right? And we don't, always get that level of visibility because that ends up being in the, you know, the government space. So a lot of this information is classified. So we don't necessarily know how often have, you know, uh, APTs leverage zero days in VPNs. So, you know, we have kind of a general idea. Obviously the scale thing, the criminal ends up being much higher um, because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for a payday and they're going to go spread everywhere. APTs, I think, or at least the nation state ones have a tendency of being a little more secretive because they don't want to disclose they have this really neat little, you know, zero day they can leverage. So, you know, it's a, you know, the zero days have always been around. I think it's just we're getting better in terms of understanding the scale. And there's been some level of scale increasing because of criminal organizations seeking to, to really, you know, monetize this, uh, this vector. Thanks. So the next question, uh, not specific to the DBIR, um, Ashley, Dan, I'm toss this to you. Um, question, what, what's being done to lock down open source um, and um, open source repositories like GitHub and, and other software? Do we see any um, progress, I guess, in stemming some of the sources of these attacks? And again, we've seen a lot of open source uh, malware and other campaigns. Um, are the platform owners themselves doing anything to help make those harder to carry out? Yeah, I can start with this. So it's a, it's a tough problem to solve. And I, I don't envy um, anyone who is hosting open source software. I think um, some of the more interesting things that threat research companies are, are doing in this space is actually monitoring a lot of these repositories and, and using behavioral algorithms to determine, you know, if something is published and it does a particular thing, probably have someone take a, a deeper look at it. And so 
they're kind of acting as as a watchdog organizations in a way. Um, I know Reversing Labs does this. We have a pretty um, interesting set of researchers who, who like to break down and analyze what exactly is being done in these open source, um, malicious open source packages. And they're really interesting. You see, you see all sorts of different types of um, of ways to to infiltrate an organization or or um, goals in the in the type of attack that's being carried out. In terms of what GitHub and, and PyPy and other uh, repositories are doing about things like this, um, first I think they're they're doing what they can. And they're doing a good job because they're very responsive to things that are reported. You know, I know on our side, you know, every time something is reported as malicious, it's down very quickly. And that's kind of what you have to do is, is be able to hear that report and, and take action and really mobilize. Um, I think we're only going to get better uh, in terms of an open source community, in terms of being able to detect these things before they're actually published. And so I, I'm hopeful that this is going to not be a, such an issue going into the future. But, you know, sometimes um, I, I think this was with PyPy recently if I'm not mistaken, but they actually shut down new account creation for quite a while because yeah. they were seeing a campaign that was just so many new accounts that were being created and these malicious packages were just being spammed. Um, and you know, that that's a, a remarkable action for them to take, but you know, what a, what is the the option there to, to prevent that? It, it could be also, you know, there's legitimate accounts and maybe there's just a, a day someday that there's lots being created. And so, you really have to walk the line of detecting potentially malicious behavior and being able to allow for similar behavior that might just be benign. It's, right. a, it's definitely a complex problem. You think the same thing with like typo squatting attacks, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're like, well, somebody set up a package with this name, you know, it's got to be malicious because it's so close. And it's like, well, if you're the platform owner, you know, who knows? You know, you don't want to just squelch at or or bury it because it seems like it might be a typo squatting attack. It seems like it might be sort of phishing a developer, but of course, often as we know, they are. So, um, but yeah, it puts them in a difficult position and you know, err on the side of being you know open and welcoming to developers. Um, so another question, I think, really anyone, any of us could answer: um, what What exactly are the weakest links in the chain? I, I'm going to throw something out there, and I'm going to say human beings are definitely. <laughs> and and Phil, maybe just talk a little bit when we when when the DBIR talks about about error uh, as being a, a leading um, you know cause in data breaches. Um, what do we mean by error? What What are we talking about there? Yeah, so the um, there's kind of two major groups of errors, right? So you have the error, which is the most common, misdelivery. I've accidentally sent PII to the wrong person. Right. Um, I've invited the wrong person to meetings before, right? It, it's it's just the nature of, of email, right? There's too many people in the address book. It is extremely common, right? And that's why organizations that regularly deal with PII have a lot of controls around that to at least help mitigate some of the risk. But that really ends up being, you know, like a very good chunk of our errors. The other part, which is sometimes a little harder to detect, is misconfiguration. All right. And this ends up being something that platforms and software uh, vendors play a large role because it comes down to the secure defaults. And we were seeing this when certain databases that are document-based databases were coming out for the ease of showing everyone how cool they are, they didn't really require passwords. So you found a bunch of passwordless databases being exposed to the internet that contained PII. Same thing with things like buckets where data is being stored. When they were initially being set up, a lot of them were either difficult to know whether it not it was you know, open to the public so what we were finding is, you know, it was like 2017, 2018, there's giant spike of S3 buckets. Um, and then, you know, other types of databases where people just accidentally misconfigured them, right? To have more permissive permissions than they should. Um, so the error definitely plays a role. And, you know, you also see this and probably something that is worth examining for uh, secrets being pushed into GitHub, the public repo. Yeah, I think there's, it's in, we've, I think we've evolved as an industry. There's now, I think GitHub does a lot of this, you know, the, a lot of tooling will help detect if you're going to be pushing an API key to your public repo. 
Um, but, you know, we see these kind of issues. But, you know, I always think the weakest link in general is bad credentials, as in authentication that does not require MFA. And building off what Ashley was saying, you know, what are, you know, GitHub and Pipel doing, I think forcing users to require MFA is becoming one of these, at least for, you know, the developers that are not malicious ones, but the established ones, right? Because we've seen, you know, phishing kits that now are going to target specifically repo accounts because they see it as a good venue of getting malware. So, you know, as much as you can protect those accounts, protect those credentials through MFA, um, I think is, is going to have a very large impact, at least for the, the ones where it's a known good entity being, you know, taken over by a, a bad entity to, to push, uh, push malware. So, you know, I think MFA and credentials as being one of the, the most important weak link we got to fix. Ashley, Dan, any thoughts on other weak links that you would uh, you would call out? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the weak link is a moving target, right? Because as soon as we address a, a weakest link, then the next weakest link is that, and the adversaries will focus it. Um, and what focusing it looks like is going to depend, right? Is it better phishing emails? Is it uh, finding, leaning into exploits and vulnerabilities and things like that? And I think, you know, if you look at things like uh, zero trust, right? It's a very popular architecture right now. If a business has a really strong zero trust architecture in place, I might argue that their weakest link is going to be a supply chain attack, wherein a trusted application is downloaded from a trusted source by a trusted user, and it's going to bypass all of your, you know, zero trust policies. So I think that's one where, you know, we can speak about it generally, but I think it's important for to do some self-assessment and maybe look at, you know, map your controls to MITRE or, or something like that and see where, where you're weak, weakest, because I don't want to offer, you know, one answer where every business is going to have a different weakest link. Um, we can offer where it, where it typically is. And I think that Phil nailed it. Uh, but I, I just wanted to add, like, assess your, do an assessment of yourself, use a tool like MITRE or something like that. And um, that might be how you decide to spend your, uh, your 2025 budget. <laughs> um, so really good final question, I think, or question to wrap on, actually, from our friend uh, Sivaram again. Um, Phil, what are your rec and and I would actually uh, open this to uh, Dan and Ashley as well to respond. What what are your recommendations for an organization using the DBIR report outputs effectively? Um, in other words, how do you operationalize uh, the lessons or uh, messages in in this year's DBIR? That, that that's a perfect question and one question that's very close to my heart is we've been trying to do this over the last couple of years to really make the report something that's more than just this, this annual report, right? That goes out, people read and get an idea and then move on, right? So uh, we've done mappings to things like controls, such as the CIS critical security controls. So it's kind of at least an idea from the patterns, you know, what are we seeing? How does that tie back to controls and organizations can implement? So, that, you know, it's kind of like a wide general base, you know, for how can we drive posture um, something else, we've collaborated a fair amount with CIS. Obviously, I'm a little biased. I worked at CIS, but, you know, they are a community resource and they do have community resources in terms of uh, using risk assessments that utilize some of the DBIR data, data utilize a subset of our public data um, to help drive the security posture. So, you know, there's ways in which organizations can use the data. I've seen some great partners. Um, smaller organizations, large organizations that use it as kind of input into their risk assessment methodology, where they'll go through and say, okay, you know, these are the type, type, you know, these are the threats you really need to worry about and the, the Verizon um, patterns, and then how do they align their controls to those patterns? So there's, I think, opportunity to drive your security posture that way. Um, I also think it's useful to spread around the organization to normalize some key cybersecurity um, group thing. <laughs> if you will, um, to other partners that don't necessarily, uh, you know, exist in the cybersecurity world. We try to make the report accessible. Um, so that means that it's not just, you know, I'm joined here by some very distinguished colleagues here. We've been in the industry for a while, right? You know, if there's, we can get value from this type of report. We also want to make sure, you know, an accountant or a lawyer, someone that isn't in the industry can still gain an understanding, but like, okay, 
I can tie back to why we're doing this. Maybe that's a little aspirational on our part, but that is kind of the things, you know, when we're writing the report, we want it to be accessible to a, a larger audience than just cybersecurity professionals. Uh, Dan, What's Ashley, that? any closing thoughts? Yeah, I might add to that. You know, one of my favorite parts about the report is the breakdown by industries. And I think that one way to really make use of this is to recognize that we can't all buy every security tool under the sun. Uh, and we certainly can't implement them all at once. And you're going to want to pick the one that's going to make the most impact of you, to you to do next. And I think one of the best ways to do that is to look at your industry, look at what's unique to you, how you're being attacked uniquely, what you have um, under attack that's unique, and then to do the most impactful thing, you're going to have to take that into consideration. And this report is just maybe the best way to take that into consideration. I, I love it for that. Not to fanboy out too much on it. <laughs> Ashley? Yeah, I think any amount of proactive posturing is better than waiting to be reactive when uh, you have an issue later on. So the fact that it's being thought about at all is great. Um, I, I think moving forward, it's really going to depend on being able to assemble cross-functional teams. Um, I think lines of responsibility are really blurred. You know, I, I don't think that key players in AppSec are traditionally key players in enterprise security. And so even just those two teams being able to function together is going to be really critical going forward, um, especially if you can start building bridges now. So it's good to think about it before it becomes an issue. Absolutely. Hey, I just wanted to say a big thank you to uh, everybody. Uh, Phil, uh, thanks for joining us. It was wonderful having you, Dan and Ashley. Thanks so much for your contributions as well. And of course, thanks to our amazing guests uh, who took uh, part. And as we just saw, asked some really, really great questions. If you were... Um, um, you know, inspired by what you heard today or intrigued and want to learn more. Um, we've got some resources for you uh, to check out both videos uh, as well as uh, other material. Um, and you can uh, take a look at that. Uh, we did a, um, uh, we have the reversing labs, uh, state of software supply chain security report as well that, um, provided some of the data that, that uh, ultimately made it into the DBIR. So I would urge you to check that out as well. And stay tuned, you know, for more um, uh, webinars and other material coming up from Reversing Labs. This is an ongoing conversation that we're having, and um, we got a lot more interesting stuff uh, coming up in the future. But um, hey, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you all again. Phil, Ashley, Dan, great job. And I uh, look forward to seeing and you again as well. That was fun. Thank, Thank you. All. All right.